Shalom from Jerusalem. My name is Joseph Shulam, and together with Brad TV, we are going through the weekly portions of the reading of the Torah. And last week, we talked about the, the portion that is called Bo, or translated in English, appear before Pharaoh, uh, or come to Pharaoh. And this week, we are in a portion called Beshalach, that starts in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, and ends in Exodus 17, verse 16. Uh, we are dealing with some of the most significant portions of the five books of Moses. With the exodus from Egypt, with the crossing of the Red Sea, with the giving of the law in Mount Sinai. And uh, last week's portion, the children of Israel actually ate the first Passover and got instructions of how to celebrate the Passover in the years to come. And... Uh, the Passover is very important, very, very important because so much of our relationship and of, of the Gospels spend time telling us about the last Passover, the last supper that Yeshua and his apostles ate in Jerusalem in Mount Zion. And so it's very important for us to understand that aspect and the aspect of the crossing of the sea and the eating of the manna and all of these things are in the subsequent portions of the reading of the Torah on Shabbat in every synagogue in the world. So this week we are in a portion called Beshalach, when Pharaoh sent them or when he let them go. Depends on which translation in English you, you, you read. When Pharaoh let them go and like I said, starts in Exodus 13, 17, ends in Exodus 17, 16. The portion from the prophets that are, are read in the synagogues every week this next Shabbat, it's from Judges chapter 4, verse 4 to 5, 31. Okay, we are going to enter into the story of what happened after the children of Israel left Egypt. One of the things that is very important for us to learn from this portion is that the children of Israel did not forget the oath that Joseph made his brothers and his relatives before he died. He told them, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. I want to be buried with Jacob, my father, and my grandfather Isaac, and my great-grandfather Abraham in Hebron, in the cave that Abraham bought from Ephron the Hittite. This is mentioned in our portion, one of the first things. They did not forget. We're talking about you know, several hundred years. About 200 years later, Joseph's body was embalmed. It was made into a mummy, mummified, like the Egyptian pharaohs. So the text says, but the children of Israel with Moses did not forget to take the bones of Joseph, the mummy of Joseph with them in the Exodus. When they left Egypt, they took the mummy with them and they brought it to the land of Canaan. Forty years they carried that mummy in order to keep their oath, their forefathers' oath to Joseph. I think this is very significant, folks, because we are in a generation that we have so much to remember and so much information. And every one of us that has an iPhone or a smartphone of any kind is, is loaded with possibilities to, to receive information, to send information all over the world instantly. But here you have children of Israel, a couple of hundred years later, remembered the oath which Joseph had made his brothers and his relatives swear that they will not bury him as an Egyptian in the land of Egypt. This, this paradigm is of great importance because Jews all over the world for 2,000 years of exodus from 
the exile have remembered and the powerful and the wealthy of Israel have always wanted to be buried in the land of Israel. I could tell you story that I was in the hospital with heart problem and in the same room there was a man 94 years old from New York never visited Israel but he was dying and he asked to be sent to Israel to the hospital in Hadassah Jerusalem and ordered to die in the land of Israel and to be buried on the Mount of Olives. I couldn't sleep all night long. 94 year old man. He said, Mama, Mama, Mama. He's calling his mother, but he came to this land to die and to be buried here in the land of Israel on the Mount of Olives. This same phenomena was with Joseph and the same phenomena was with Jacob. They wanted to be buried in the land that God promised their forefathers, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And the children of Israel didn't forget it. And the Torah makes it sure that we remember that they kept their oath. The second thing that we learn in this portion of Beshalach, when Pharaoh sent them out, is from Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, 22. I'm reading the text. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from the before the people, the people of Israel. It's a very interesting text. And it's very famous. So we're going to see it repeated, this concept repeated in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. Look, what is the indication of this? The indication of this is that when the children of Israel left Egypt, the Lord went with them. His presence, his, as they say in English, shina in Hebrew, shakaina in English, went with him by day and by night. His presence was in the camp of Israel. They didn't come out of Egypt on their own. And, and we have this same concept repeated by Yeshua in the Gospels. Behold, I am with you until the end of days, Yeshua says to his disciples. And it's a teaching that I didn't hear very much from the years and years of going to church and speaking in churches all over the world and, and studying in Christian colleges. Uh, I didn't hear this teaching very much. Behold, I am with you to the end of days. This text here in our portion, in chapter 13 of, of the book of Exodus, gives us these two symbols of the Exodus, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud by night in the heart of the camp of Israel, even before the tabernacle was built. God's presence was with them in their camp. And this is something that, that I want to connect again with the teaching of Yeshua that is both in the Gospels and, and implied by other texts in the letters of the apostles. Yeshua says, Lo, I'm with you. With you all the time. Till the end of days. Till the eschaton. Till the millennium, if you wish. And of course, after the millennium, we'll be with him forever. So, God is our partner. He's not our a dictator, a tyrant that is taking us out of our slavery and, and abandoning us in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, folks. He is with us through thick and thin. And one of the most moving pictures that I know is actually in the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And that picture is that drawn by a child, that 
Jesus is on the cross. It's a black and white picture. And uh, the children of Israel are being led through barbed wire path on both sides into the death camp. And Jesus sends out his hand and say, take me with you. That picture is a, is a very moving picture for me, very significant picture. Because, yes, when the Jews were going to the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and Dachau and Ravensbrück and other places during the Nazi attempt to wipe out the seed of Abraham from the face of the earth, Jesus went with them into the death camps, into the crematoriums. And the witness of that is that among the people who founded our ministry in Jerusalem were two Orthodox Jews that were born and raised in, in Hungary, in Budapest, and went on that horrible march in the January of 1945 from Budapest to the death camps of Germany and Poland. And they found Jesus in the barracks of the death camps, in their labor on the death, in the death camps. And they were among the founders of our ministry in Jerusalem. Joseph and David Vactor are their names. So yes, the Jews did not go into the gas chambers and the crematoriums on their own. God was with them. And when Christians killed the Jews, if Jesus was alive that time, they would have killed him too. They would have gassed him too. Yes, because he's a Jew and he never stopped being a Jew. So, we're continuing. Continuing now into chapter 14 of the book of Exodus. And I'm going to read from verse 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who, whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Pharaoh changed his mind. After he released the children of Israel, he changed his mind. He says, oh, I can't afford to lose this cheap labor of slaves working and building my cities, my funerary cities. Oh, I need them. It was a mistake to release them. He forgot that he released them because the tenth plague killed all the firstborn of Egypt. Not of only of the people, but also of the animals of the firstborn died in that plague. And so he chased with hundreds of chariots and his army on horses, chased the children of Israel. And they were in front of them where was the sea and behind them was Pharaoh and his army. And they didn't know what to do. And they were in a total bind with, without any hope to escape the trained army of the Egyptians on chariots. And they were young and old and babies and children walking. The sea in front and the Egyptians behind. And Moses says these words from chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Don't worry, God is with us. This is the last time you're going to see the Egyptian army. This is the last time you'll see those that whipped you with whips and forced you to labor in the mud and in the brick factories that built the cities of Egypt. No, they're not going to see them again. All you have to do is stand still. Be silent. Don't worry. The salvation of the Lord is coming today 
Now, it takes faith, folks, at, the, at, at this circumstance to say, stand still, shut up. God is at working to solve your problem. The children of Israel didn't necessarily have that faith. But Moses and Aaron, who had encounters with God and had seen the hand of God move over the Egyptians and over the land of Egypt, knew that God did not take them out into the wilderness so that they will die there at the hands of the Egyptian. I said, stand still. The salvation of the Lord is coming today. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. This, this paradigm is very important for us because we have theological faith. We believe in doctrine A, doctrine B, doctrine C, premillennial, postmillennial, panmillennial, amillennial. We believe in all these doctrines and we judge one another on these doctrines. But no, there's no such a thing in the Bible, folks. Our faith is not a faith based on theological uh, doctrines. Our faith is faith on relationship, on trust, trusting God and His promises. That's where our faith should be. The divisiveness that denominations have created based on doctrinal issues is artificial. And so... We need to realize that what we would do if we were in the same situation as the children of Israel with Moses were, with the sea in front, the enemy behind, will we have enough faith and trust in the Lord to do what he says? Be quiet, shut up, because the salvation of the Lord is coming. You just stand still and observe God's work. And I think that this, in the history of Israel, we've had more than one occasion in which this was the situation and we have experienced it physically, even in the 20th century. So let's build our faith and know that God is our partner. Yeshua is our partner. And we are together in this battle. And we are together in fulfilling the promises that God gave to our forefathers and to our prophets of the restoration of Israel, return out of exile back to this land. And this portion is, is of the Torah is a great demonstration of this power. Yes. And now we come to chapter 15 of uh, the book of Exodus. And the crossing of the Red Sea and the song of Moses is with us. And I want to read us from the book of Revelation, chapter 15, verses 2 and 3, to connect the revelation with the exodus from Egypt and to show you as, as our Christian brothers and sisters how important the Torah is for understanding the new covenant, the good news, the gospels, and the teaching of Yeshua Mashiach and his apostles. I'm reading from Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are you, your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Here you have it. At the Last book of the New Covenant. Describing the last scenes of glory and praise and worship of the Lamb sitting on the throne. The Lamb of God, Yeshua, Mashiach, sitting on the throne 
And what are they going to be singing? They're not going to be singing Amazing Grace. They're going to be singing, my dear brothers and sisters, the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Song of Moses is this chapter, Exodus chapter 15, and it's glorious victory that God gives the children of Israel. The children of Israel cross the sea in dry land. Their enemies drown. And again in the book of Revelation, we see that the end of evil of Satan and all of his angels is very much connected with this exodus from Egypt. The paradigm is the exodus from Egypt, my dear brothers and sisters. Because if you read in Revelation 20 verse 10, it says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the word of God in the book of Revelation chapter 20, folks. So yes, the exodus from Egypt is the children of Israel out of slavery, 40 years in the wilderness, a trial period and re-education period, the conquest of the land of Israel, the keeping of God's promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That this land that he gave to Abraham and his seed forever is going to be forever the home, the habitation, and the inheritance of the people of God, of Israel and the people of God, I should say. So yes, this is the portion that we're talking about. This is the portion that, that all the synagogues are going to read this next Shabbat. I'm going to end with this text from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 to 6. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel accompanied, complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather the certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And this is to be the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in and shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's the text. The two things I want to summarize here. One thing is, yes, miracles don't change people's hearts. And don't change people's faith. They're wonderful to experience, but people don't change from miracles. This text in the book of Exodus chapter 16 is clear. Children of Israel crossed the sea with a mighty hand, so their enemies drown in the sea, but they didn't change their faithfulness. They didn't change their faith. They still complained. They forgot that God is their partner in this journey in the wilderness. They forgot that God's presence is with them day and night in their camp. They forgot to trust God and they complained. But God said, okay, I will continue having patience with them and I will again prove to them from the bread from heaven, the manna, that I am with them and that I am faithful to keep my promises. Hallelujah. This is true. And we see that this also connects us with the gospel because I'm going to read to you from John chapter 6, verse 32 to 38. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Talking about Himself. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Yeshua said to them, I 
am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will get, come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Yeshua is that bread, the manna from heaven. And Yeshua is keeping his word. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they were baptized under the cloud by day and at the pillar of fire by night and they crossed the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the spiritual food that they ate and drank in the wilderness. And this becomes a symbol. And the rock from which they drank in the wilderness twice is the Messiah. And it's interesting, dear brothers, that this same truth is understood by, by the rabbis, by the great rabbis of Judaism, that that rock is the Messiah. And we have this whole portion of the Torah that points to God, to his faithfulness, to his keeping of the promises, and Yeshua connects it with himself and with the bread of life that comes from him. May God bless all of us and keep reading the Torah and the prophets and the new covenant and be blessed in your reading. In Yeshua's name, amen.